Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, help us to hear what you would have us hear and then do what you would have us do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm Scott Mann, one of the pastors here, and I want to welcome all of you here. Glad to be together with you, and welcome to those of you worshiping at our 11 o'clock service, especially our youth. We're glad you're here, and all of you worshiping online. When I was in college, the same thing would happen to me with surprising frequency. One friend or another would come into my room, shut the door, and just start crying. And then the story would come. He just did something he deeply regretted and felt awful. He truly loved Jesus and wanted to live for him, loving others and himself, but he just failed big time. And along with deep grief and remorse, in every single case, there was always some surprise. How could I have done this? Or even worse, how could I do this again? After each of these sacred conversations, I thought, I know his heart. If this could happen to him, it could happen to me. But I was just as clueless as my friend as to exactly how this could happen, especially when we knew better. Now I know that virtually all of us have felt this way, and most still don't understand how we lose control of our thoughts, words, and actions. So when we decided to preach through the fruit of the Spirit this summer, I claimed self-control. And you know, not one of the other preachers fought me for it. <laughs> Maybe our preachers feel the same way you and I feel about self-control. We'd rather not talk about it because we struggle with it. Maybe you feel like a failure in this area, but trust me, it's not hopeless. The Bible has good news about how we cultivate self-control. And I'm grateful for the chance to share a little bit of what I've learned about the most misunderstood fruit in Paul's list. To understand how self-control works and what practical steps we can take, we must pay attention to the surrounding verses where Paul does his main teaching. Throughout this chapter, Paul reaffirms self-control as a virtue. Now, self-control was universally recognized as a virtue in the ancient Near East. Philosophers and religious leaders across culture praised self-control, urging people to believe that their lives would be better if they would practice this virtue. So Paul encourages self-control, and then to drive home his point, he lists the damage from a lack of self-control. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. It's quite a list. Most people then and now have a bit of a love-hate relationship with self-control. We love that self-control helps us thrive, nourish relationships and accomplish goals. We hate how life without restraint quickly spins out of control and destroys people and their relationships with God, with others, and everyone around, everything around them. Many people affirm the virtue of self-control. Few people excel at practicing it, especially when it counts. To do that, we have to understand the dynamics of self-control and how it works. And this is where we get surprised. Like Jesus so often did, Paul surprises us by affirming a virtue and then turning it upside down and showing how self-control is also a trap in three different ways. First, Paul reminds us that all of these virtues are fruit, meaning they are results to receive more than they are goals to achieve. This is an important distinction for his whole argument. When we make self-control or any of these virtues a goal, we run the risk of missing them. They are the fruit of something else in our lives. 
We don't grit our teeth and generate joy on command, right? Or peace or gentleness or any of the other fruit. Any more than we do with self-control. That's not how it works. Paul focuses this whole chapter and the next on the Holy Spirit. These virtues are a fruit of the Holy Spirit's life within us. So the first trap is mistaking a fruit for a goal. It's the wrong goal to get us where we want to go. The second and third parts of the trap are even worse. Self-control is the absolute worst named virtue in English. If you focus on self or you focus on control, you can't succeed at self-control. <laughs> Go figure. It's no wonder we feel like failures. We don't know the secret Paul explains in this chapter. Listen. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Paul carefully parallels desires of the flesh and under the law to describe our uncontrolled passion or our hyper-controlled rule-following. Paul says whether a person is enslaved by worldly sins or by religious striving, it's all essentially a focus on self. He says both of these are selfish impulses, and they are in conflict with the Holy Spirit. That's part of the secret of self-control. Of self we don't focus on self. We focus on the Spirit. I'll never forget what my youth group leaders told me. Don't focus on not sinning. Focus on imitating Jesus. Jesus understood that sinning or not sinning misses the whole point. The point is to live in a loving relationship with God and others. Living by the Spirit puts Jesus, not me, at the center of my life. This, in turn, starves sin and striving, and it produces all the fruit of the Spirit without us gritting our teeth. Now, athletes understand this key principle. They don't focus on not failing. They focus on their mental game, on fundamental skills, and on teamwork. Coaches teach the dynamics of the game, and then players keep practicing until skills become more natural. Winners don't focus on not losing. So first, self-control is a fruit or a result, but not a goal in itself. Second, it's fundamentally not about self, but about the spirit. And the third trap is self-control isn't about seeking to control. Paul explains... You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Jesus set us free from the traps of sin and selfishness and striving to be good enough. God's unconditional love exposes all of that for the ugly slavery it is. Paul urges us to not go back into slavery to these things. Instead, we experience freedom and life abundant by surrendering control to God and serving others in love. One secret to self-control is to surrender to the only one who's worthy of control and invite Jesus to be our master. We follow our Lord, not ourselves. It's no coincidence the 12 steps of addiction recovery have been a worldwide success. They were developed from these biblical principles. And the first three steps are critical to any progress in self-control. Step one, admit I cannot control myself and need help. Step two, believe God can help me. Step three, surrender control to God. Those are the first three steps of 12 steps. Jesus and Paul remind us there's only one worthy master who loves us 
and gives us freedom from self and freedom for loving God and others. Paul continues, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul repeats that self-control is not about self or control, but about the spirit and serving. This is the secret sauce that most people simply don't understand and why we fail at self-control. This is why Jesus can say, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He stayed focused on loving and imitating his father, doing what he saw his father doing. That's the freedom he gives us. We stay focused on loving and imitating Jesus, not focusing on the 613 things we should be doing or not doing. We surrender control And the Holy Spirit does the work, steering our lives in the best directions. Paul concludes, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. In our passage, Paul repeats, walk by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, and keep in step with the Spirit. Paul emphasizes both God's part in leading us and our part in following. Now, God does his part in forgiving us, freeing us, giving us new life, and much more. Our part is to keep in step with the Spirit. So how do we do this? How do we help cultivate the fruit of self-control in our everyday lives? Well, the starting point for every Christian is to admit We are powerless to save ourselves and trust Jesus to be our Savior and Lord. This isn't something we do just once in life. We regularly confess our need for God and trust Jesus to grow us into faithful disciples. We repeatedly surrender control of our lives to him. The problem is we quickly take back control of the steering wheel from Jesus and we try to control our own life, which eventually sends us in the wrong direction and somebody gets hurt. So the first step in living by the Spirit and growing in self-control is to surrender control and trust Jesus over and over as often as needed. We trust our coach in order to win the mental game. Next, we need to practice our fundamentals. If you've been around church much, you know how important it is to build these five fundamentals of spiritual growth into your life somehow. So I'll briefly touch on how each of these five life-giving practices helps us be led by the Spirit and mature in self-control. Now, we can't walk in step with someone without knowing and communicating with them. Spending time speaking to God and listening to God are indispensable. We call this prayer, but it can take many forms. The point isn't the form. It's the relationship between you and the God who loves you. Jesus modeled this, and Christians have always pointed to prayer as the most important practice to be led by the Spirit. Sometimes we make it more complicated than it is. However you do it, just spend time talking and listening to the Spirit, alone, with others, in silence, in song, whatever. Prayer is a learned skill. You practice and you get better. But that's another sermon. Closely related to prayer is getting to know God better through Scripture, His self-revelation to us. We know God not because we imagine what he is like and recreate and create him in our own image. No, we know God by how God has revealed himself to us, foremost in scripture. Here's a handy little test. Ask yourself this. When was the last time God surprised or corrected me? If God hasn't surprised or corrected you lately, you're probably not following the true God, only your image of him. In both the Old and the New Testaments, God was constantly surprising people, and Jesus was famous for this. Scripture keeps us honest. 
get to know the real Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as they are found in Scripture, and we will be able to walk in step with them, and our lives will evidence the fruit of the Spirit. People tell me, I don't understand the Bible. Just obey what you do understand. Learning Scripture is a lot like learning a new sport or learning a foreign language. Learn a little, practice a lot. Practice what you do understand, and over time, obedience to Scripture shapes us, and we become like Jesus, who modeled self-control and lived and enjoyed the abundant life. Another fundamental practice that powerfully shapes us is worship, where we intentionally put God back in the center of our attention and our lives. Now, it is true that we benefit by individually worshiping God by ourselves. But God makes clear that we are shaped most powerfully to be God's people as we worship together. We need to be reminded that God is worthy of our gathered worship on a regular basis. If we want to grow as Christians, we need worship at least weekly or we will be enslaved by our schedules, our goals, our pressures, ourselves. We are not the center of the universe, and gathered worship reminds us to put God first and to walk with God along with others who have their own joys and concerns and experiences with God that I need to be shaped by. All of this helps grow self-control. And it starves selfishness and greed and pride and sloth and all the rest. This leads naturally to the next fundamental, other believers. Some call it fellowship or community or one anothering. God designed the universe so that we cannot become mature without others. The power of others to influence us cannot be overstated. This is why the Bible talks so much about, about this and why so much of Jesus' ministry was in close interpersonal relationships. We only grow in self-control alongside others. We all need external accountability to enjoy our best lives. In my high school youth group, I was taught two ways to resist temptation. First, Never underestimate temptations. Let's say that together. Never underestimate temptations. They are powerful. Certain situations put us at risk, and they happen all the time. Don't pretend they don't, and be wise about putting yourself in certain situations. Remember, the temptation starts when you decide to put yourself in a tempting situation. The second way to resist temptation is never overestimate your self-control. Together, never overestimate your self-control. Maybe you've heard the saying, pride goes before a fall. When we think we can handle a temptation ourselves, we violate God's design of the universe. We aren't intended to be able to do this ourselves. We need others to help us. That's why we seek out accountability partners, 12-step sponsors, mentors, spouses, whatever other relationships and practices help us stay in step with the Holy Spirit and not fall into the slavery of sin or self or whatever. Finally, one of the best ways to grow in maturity and self-control is to do the work of Jesus. Whether you call it loving your neighbor or serving or mission, doing the work of Jesus helps us keep in step with the Holy Spirit and grow self-control. The more we focus first on Christ's kingdom and God's loving intention for others, the less we get caught up in ourselves and in any number of temptations. 
We have less time for temptation and have less and less interest in it anyway because Jesus is giving us life abundant as we freely give our lives away in loving service. It's just how it works. So we focus our mental game, admitting we need help, trusting Jesus, and surrendering control. And we practice the five fundamentals to help us thrive. I didn't realize as a kid that practicing the mental game and the fundamentals cultivated self-control. But it does. That's what it does. Now, if you remember nothing else from this sermon, remember this. From now on, when you hear the word self-control, replace self with spirit and control with surrender and service. The secret to self-control is spirit, surrender, and service. Paul stays laser-focused on these two things, keeping in step with the Holy Spirit and loving our neighbor as ourselves. Focus on that, and you will grow self-control. That's how we avoid the traps and produce the fruit. Amen? Amen? So, Jesus, we trust our lives to your loving control. Holy Spirit, lead us and grow your fruit in us. Father, help us to spread your loving kingdom throughout our world. Amen.